here. All right, cool. <laughs> All right, we'll try this again. Lena, hello. I'm Tom from You Know I Got Soul. Thank you so much for joining us for this interview. My pleasure. You know, it, it's crazy. I was, you know, I posted the flyer for this interview, and one of our readers said, Lena, that's my favorite artist. You know, that's just so dope to me that, you know, I love it. You know, I love that type of thing. I don't know if you hear that at all, but, you know, that's it's amazing. So yeah, I appreciate it. It's it's from an influence of parents who did jazz and blues music coming from East Texas. Yeah. Just listening to their music and then my music. And so it's like a blend of everything. Right. I want to take it back to the beginning, though, and, and start talking through some of your history. You know, where I love to hear these these stories of how artists got signed. So when you signed with Atlantic, you know, how did that journey happen? Like, how did that situation even come about? Wow, it was it was pre really interesting because even back then I had these uh, aspirations of having my own label and as a female that was rare. So what I wow. did is I started recording songs and making started taking pictures on my own, just having friends, you know, style me and everything. So we ended up with this um, about eight songs, like an EP back then would be considered an EP. We made a picture and we put it together. And then I had just moved from Texas to, to Hollywood, North Hollywood. So we started doing shows around town. And the first label that actually was interested, it was a label, it was called Priority. Back mm. then it was all rappers. You know, and then after Priority was interested, it was, uh, I think it was Jive, but a, a few labels started coming to the table. So then it was this bid more, and Atlantic came to the table last, Craig Calvin and it. Yeah. And, you know, my manager at the time was like, I think this label gets you because, you know, Craig was a DJ. So he actually inspired me to name the first album Stranger on Earth because he introduced me to a song called Stranger on Earth. And he had it, he had all these jazz records and bebop music and swing music. And it was exactly what I was into. So my manager was like, this is a good match for you because he actually understands the music. And he really did get it, you know. So we yeah. decided to go with Atlantic Records. You know, I would have gone with Priority, but he was like, they have only rappers, you know, but they were yeah. at the label. But, you know, right. we met Craig. We met him at, um, he actually came to the house. It was crazy. Oh. Under her room, okay, to the house. Wow. A lot of executives were actually coming to our house before we signed. And um, he came over, and then we met him at Mr. Charles in Beverly Hills. And wow. We were on the same page, so. That's pretty cool. And and you were doing writing before your album even came out, your debut. You were writing for other artists. I, I think I read Tyrese was one of the ones who had a, you know, a song. How did that even come about, all that, those writing? Let's see. There was there was a label that uh, Tyrese and I were both interested in signing to. That's where I met him, and it was when he it was before he got his Coke commercial. You know where he got discovered, um, the with the Coke commercial, and we were I, what is this guy's name? I think his name was Brian something. But anyway, it was in Hollywood. We were really young, and um, I met him then, and so when. I met this other group of producers. They were a boy group at one point, and they were up in New York. It was my first time going to New York, so I went up there with this man named Lionel Job. Mm -hmm. Lionel a, a guy group, and he was signed. He had artists that were signed to it, uh, Mariah Carey. She had a label. So I started writing for her artists and just writing wow. for other artists. And then Lionel got Jive Records. I think that's who Tyrese was signed to then. He got them to send Tyrese over because they liked some tracks that he had produced. So Tyrese came over and recorded the song. And well, I wrote the song. I had just went to New York and just stayed there in a writing camp and just wrote for like months. But then wow. Tyrese heard the song "Ain't Nothing Like a Jones," and mm -hmm. it actually made my first album. So and I in my background stayed on. I, I was really excited about that because that was my first real exposure in the music industry. Yeah. Wow, that's pretty cool. I got to talk about now your debut album, Stranger on Earth. You know, let me just share a few comments on this album because I still keep it personally in heavy rotation because I am a huge R&B lover. And for me, when it came out, it sounded like nothing else out at the time. Now, it still sounds like it's ahead of its time. Like, it just sounds fresh still to this day. 
I love the album to this day. So talk about even creating that project. It was one of those things that I didn't think would ever get heard. Mm. And that's why, that's why I was so free. And that's why there was, I was so uninhibited because I just didn't think anybody would ever hear this. Like all I was doing was putting sounds together that I loved. You know, I wasn't following any rules. Um, so because I love Sarah Vaughn and the whole Cotton Club area era, uh, like I said, my mom sang jazz. My dad was a blues singer. And then I went off to school and got introduced to um, Etta James and Sachmo, all these all these great jazz musicians on the East Coast. That's where I got introduced. Mm -hmm. And um, so when I got back to home and then moved to California, I um, I just I was into Jay Z, you know, Tupac, and you know, everybody yeah. like that. So I love the beat, you know, the driving beats, but I wanted to keep that vintage sound and. Um, so I put together all those sounds and just started singing. Because, you know, I got a scholarship to sing opera at Howard University. So I had 17th mm. century Baroque and classical influence. And that kind of was all together like an area. They had an operatic tone. So I just put that together, had these songs recorded, met this producer named Travis. He got it. And then there was a guy who played on a band that I was in. It was an independent band where we did covers to make our rent. Um, his name was Jeeve. He was from France. I met him first because he was in my band. But when it came to producing the music and everything, there was this kid out of North Hollywood. He hadn't done any projects, you know. But I heard him. He got it. He was, he, what happened was I told him what I was interested in. I had a few songs recorded. And then I told him the Benny Goodman band was one of my favorite. He yeah. went home. <laughs> And within about three or four hours, he sent me a track. And and he sent the track to me. You know, at the time, he had to bring it over because we didn't have, like, internet like that. So he brought this track over on a CD. And within, like, 30 minutes, I had wrote that song, Play a No More. Yeah. That's with the opera. And it, and it was like, this is so weird. It's opera. It's hip-hop. What is it? You know, Craig Calman loves it. And basically, that song is the reason why the labels were interested playing them on the first song right right that's pretty cool i mean it's great i still remember where i was when i first heard it's all right you know the song the single you put out with bubonic oh, yeah. and my favorite songs actually weren't even sick like you didn't even release them as singles that was waiting and bye bye baby, bye -bye, baby. i don't know those songs just hit me like i still have them in heavy rotation I mean, talk about something like songs like that. I mean, that they weren't even, it's crazy that you had such strong single, you know, songs that weren't even singles on the album. Yeah, thank you. I hear that a lot about Bye Bye Baby and Waiting. Bye yeah. Bye Baby, there's a group there, you know, um, Will Smith and Jazzy Jeff, they had a group of producers called, oh my God, my mind just went blank. But Jazzy, Touch of Jazz? Touch of Jazz, my guys. Yeah. Keith Pils I was, <laughs> them i was just writing with them keith keith pelzer and ivan barrios and wow. um all the guys over there and um the the track um bye bye baby ivan barrios created um and and sent it to me he just he didn't he hadn't heard what i was doing yet this was just a crack a crack that he had in his catalog so I heard it and I liked it. And at the time, you know, a lot of people didn't, didn't get what I was doing. But when I actually put vocals on it, then they understood. And I didn't have a record deal when I wrote the song with the Touch of Jazz. This was just something that I picked out of the catalog because I was already writing with the guys over there. And um, once I I had actually met Jill, too, before she got signed. And then wow. later we would, we would end up label mates. But I met her at a Touch of Jazz one day when she came in and she uh, started working there because they had a lot of writers coming through and stuff like that. Right. And I think she was teaching. I don't know, but she was real cool. We sat down and she was really about her business. I'll never forget it. She was like, <laughs> talking about publishing. She was on top of it. <laughs> a lot of people yeah. didn't know a lot about publishing back then, but I guess because she was educated already, like her parents or teachers, I don't know, something like that, but she was on top of that publishing. So we discussed mm -hmm. publishing and I knew a little bit about publishing from writing the Tyrese song. You know, and I had a, a manager at the time that taught me about publishing. So I was able to 
uh, share with her some information about publishing. But that's where Bye Bye Baby came from, A Touch of Jazz, that camp. Right. And Waiting Waiting was produced by Jeeves. Um, it's just something we kind of like vibed out. There was a, a, friend, a few friends in the studio. Ken was one of them. And, and he was like, I like this track. And once we just put it on, I started vibing and wrote it. And they were all there supporting me recording it. But I hear a lot from people that Waiting is. Waiting, Bye Bye Baby is like, you know, a couple of their favorite songs. It was just timing too. I think the album got stunted growth because, you know, 9-11 happened. Yeah. yeah. Came, the, the date for my release was 928. So that mm. was crazy. Like, yeah. we couldn't it's kinda like what's going on now. Nobody was leaving home and yeah. everybody was scared and you know, it was like those times. Gotcha. So then eventually you, you left Atlantic and you know, you ended up at Hidden Beach, you know, the label. Um what was that whole process like of moving between the labels? That was it was kind of, it was a little bit dark because Atlantic Records, we were, we were like a family, you know, and mm. all the support I had for this label, um, um, all the press, big write-ups and everything. And then we're setting up for this release date. I had already been out on the road with Guru. I had been out with John mm. Osborne and uh, Craig David in the UK. We had really set up this album. And the tours, we had tour dates set to start, you know, touring, you know, around the time when the album was getting ready to be released. You know how it was. The album would come out on Tuesday, back yeah. then, and then you would do all your support before and after. So we started supporting the album, and the next week when we had our major tours, we couldn't go anywhere. Remember, we couldn't fly. Yeah. So yeah. we couldn't... You know, we, it was a scary time. Nobody knew what was happening. I know where I was when I saw the, um, the planes crash into the building because I also lived, I also took the World Trade Center to and from New York all the time. Except this time wow. I just had L.A. at Damn. that time. <laughs> but we, you know, any artist that came out around that time, you know, we couldn't support our record. You know, the morale was down. It was a, It was really a dark time. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, I'm here in New York City, so I remember 9-11 pretty vividly, so wow. I know how it was. <laughs> crazy. But shortly, I stayed there, Craig, and then I didn't get dropped. I actually asked to be released, and Craig Kalman, um, you know, they, they let me go. They weren't trying to, you know, I heard, I heard all those stories about, you know, how you can get put on the shelf and whatever, but I started thinking, you know, maybe because of Touch of Jazz and how the Neo Soul movement was happening. And I did not know myself, like, where I could fit because it wasn't just R&B. It wasn't jazz. It wasn't Neo Soul. It wasn't hip hop. But it had elements mm -hmm. of all of that. So I was kind of like an outcast in the industry because I would see my peers. I would get booked on the show and they would be like, oh, she's, she's not one of us. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, but what happened is Gil Miller... After I signed, after I signed with Hidden Beach, and what happened with Hidden Beach is that's my same manager and producer. Um, they introduced me to Steve McKeever, Travis, the producer. He was uh, interested in signing. He could actually really sing. He was interested in signing with Hidden Beach, but they ended up hearing his production because he played some of the music, and they was like, "Oh, we want that girl." So mm. then I went to him, and that was the neo soul movement. And Skip Miller, he used to uh, manage the Jacksons at Motel. He ended up being my manager, and he introduced me to Stevie Wonder and all these people to help me get the singles and stuff that were played on the radio and stuff. They loved it. You know, Stevie Wonder, if he likes your song, I, you know, what can you say? <laughs> so yeah. he called the single smooth once I signed with Hidden Beach. But what happened was the Grammys did introduce uh, an entry for artists like me, and I... And, Skip, you know, he was like, they did this for you because you're not soul, you're not hip hop, you're not. So it was alternative R and D. Remember that category? It's not there yeah. anymore. So <laughs> it's gone. Ain't that crazy? It's gone. I got yeah. nominations for that for that inner beauty uh, considerations for that um, inner beauty album. Five of the songs from that album, and that category stayed open and I think Jill Scott later on won in that category and some other artists like Lettucey and stuff like that. 
you know, mm. who who were just unique and amazing, you know, that category for this, but it's no longer there, so. Yeah. <laughs> so alternative well, R&B, I guess.